what work was meant to be, which is God's design for work, what it was meant to be and still can be. Uh, then we're going to, after a break, uh, we're going to do a case study. And after that, we're going to uh, consider taking your soul to work, which is spirituality and work. We really need five full days for that. I'm teaching a course in July at Regent College in five full days on taking your soul to work. We're going to have lunch, and then uh, we're going to find uh, how to find joy in your work. And there will be some small group discussion this afternoon, and we're going to end with money and leadership. So uh, that's how the day's going to shape up, and I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you will too, and we'll have a good time, and I hope for um, a learning time for all of us, and myself included. Dennis Bakke is the person who wrote the book Joy at Work, and it's a very significant book about his leadership in the largest energy company in the world, AES, he said, God intended that the workplace be beautiful, exciting, and satisfying. Work was to be filled with joy. Work as a major reason for our creation. Intended to be an act of worship. It was one of the most significant ways in which we can honor our Creator. I got here quite early this morning because I wasn't sure how the traffic would be. And so I went out and got a coffee down the road. But there is a dear gentleman smashing concrete with a piece of metal rebar that he had sharpened at the end. It's very hard work. And I thought, I don't think he's experiencing joy at work. And it's not a beautiful workplace. And we all know that it's not easy, even in an office tower or if you're in a in a, a telephone answering service uh, business. Nothing is easy. I remember sitting on the light rapid transit in Manila and uh, a young it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. A young woman was sitting beside me and I said, do you mind if I ask you if you're, if you're on your way home from work? And she said, yes, I am. And I said, isn't it early? It's only 2 o'clock. She said, well, I work for a call center. And uh, my shift ends at 1 o'clock. So I said, you know, you have a really difficult job. She works for a telephone company in the eastern United States. And uh, I said, you have a really difficult job. When people phone you, uh, they are angry because something has not been done right. Oh, she said, they're terrible. They're abusive. They say terrible things to me. And then she said something really interesting. She said, I get to talk them down. <laughs> and at the end, they thank me. <laughs> I thought, oh, is she ever well suited for her work? <laughs> she is well suited. What is work? Work is energy expanded, not expended, expended, yes, whether manual, mental, or both whether or not it is remunerated. I'd like to add the word expended purposefully because when you do something in sports or leisure, you may be expending energy, but you're not accomplishing anything by it. So work is energy expended purposefully, whether manual, mental, or both, and whether or not it's remunerated. So you may not earn any money from your work but you're working. Now, today work is changing. Uh, lots of people are still doing work like the gentleman down the road, smashing concrete, making way for a new um, driveway for some kind of store. But there is a shift, and it's throughout the world, from manual to mental. And it's the technological revolution that has made this possible that more and more people are using their heads, their brains, rather than their hands and their feet, their brawn. Lots of people are still doing manual work. 
Manual work's good. I've been a carpenter, and there's something wonderful about making something with your hands and seeing them when it's finished for a meal, perhaps, which you've made, and you say, wow, it's good. But more and more people are using their heads. It's the latest invention in office safety. When your computer crashes, an airbag is activated so you won't bang your head in frustration. <laughs> so, uh, and further, there is a shift today from making products to providing a service. Now, of course, there's lots and lots of people making things, particularly in China, um, where I've been many, many times. But actually, the shift is from making things, products, to providing a service. And I wish I knew the percentage of workers in the Philippines that are providing a service. Of course, call centers, yes, but also people working in Jollibee and folks behind the counter in so many different places, as well as educators and other people that are providing a service. And that working with tangibles to working with intangibles. Intangibles means you can't touch it. It's something you can't get your hands on. And uh, when I was uh, doing carpentry, we were building new houses in Vancouver. We were also re re rebuilding older houses and fixing them up and uh, making them, uh, improving them in some way. But uh, when we would build a house, uh, our houses are all made of wood rather than concrete blocks and cement. Most of them at least are. And uh, we can actually create the framework of one story of a house in one day. It's really quite amazing. We use two by fours, two by sixes, hammer them together and all the rest. And at the end of the day, I could take off my nail belt and I'd look back and I'd say, yeah, we actually built one story of a house today. We could see what we've done. I come to the end of a day like today and I think, what did I do? I can't see anything. I do see your lovely faces. But I can't see what I've done. And that's true for many, many people in the modern and postmodern world. From repetitive tasks to intervention. And of course, there still are lots and lots of people doing repetitive things like this. This is the cracker salter. He's got a conveyor belt and the crackers come by and he puts salt on and so on. I've been in many factories in China and uh, some of my friends actually own these factories. And they're very, it's good, they're good situations. They're not sweatshops. But people do sit beside conveyor belts and take off a little PC board and screw on a speaker or an integrated circuit, put it back on. And they move them around, they learn new skills, they have a good place to sleep and eat and get their hair done if it's a woman. And of course, I don't get my hair done anymore. You know, a long time ago when I was in Manila, I had a full beard. Nobody is stupid enough in Manila to wear a full beard, okay? I did. And it needed to be trimmed, so I was trying to find if somebody said a unisex hair salon would do it. I went into three different unisex hair salons in uh, Green, Green Hills Mall, and nobody would touch me. I finally found a barber that would do it, and uh, he, he, he said, I'll do it. But five men stood around the chair and watched it being done. Anyway, repetitive tasks. Uh, still people doing it, of course, but lots and lots and lots of people are doing something that could be called intervention. Now, what do I mean by intervention? After being in China, I came back to Vancouver, and I have a friend who owns a high-tech company. It's not a big company, but they have a machine in there with spools of components, and an operator is on a uh, computer and he intervenes, he puts in the particular combination of components that he wants for this thing that he's making 
and two minutes later, out comes a complete unit for an MRI machine. Now, he's intervened. And even in our big sawmills for wood in Canada, it used to be people were working really hard physically, doing the same thing, pushing this log and that piece of... And now all they do is sit on a computer and tell the machine what to do. So that's what's happening. And then from hard work to stressful work. My grandfather, on my father's side, was a baker in England, and he came to Canada and uh, bought a bakery. But my grandfather, on my mother's side, was a fisherman, and he owned a 70-foot, that's about uh, 25 meters, uh, 20 meters, uh, 20-meter vessel, which he sailed to the north of the Atlantic in Labrador uh, every year for six months and brought back a hold full of salted cod fish. It was hard work, but it wasn't stressful work. It was hard work. But today our work is stressful. I became the academic dean at Regent College, and the day that I became the dean, the students put this card on my door, and I don't know where they found it, but it actually does say Mr. Stevens on this card. Open even wider, Mr. Stevens, just out of curiosity, we're going to see if we can also cram in this tennis ball, okay? Now, I go to a dentist near where I live, and she's Chinese, uh, Dr. Susan Chow. She's a lovely, lovely person, and she has looked after four generations of our family, my parents-in-law right through to my grandchildren, and she's really good. She looked into my mouth when I became dean, and she said, Paul, have you changed jobs? I said, Susan, how do you know? She said, you're grinding your teeth at night, all night long, because of the problems, the stress, okay? Now, six years later, I stopped being dean. Now, I go to the dentist every year, so I didn't wait six years. But after six years, I went once again, and she looked into my mouth, and she said, Paul, have you changed jobs again? I said, Susan, how do you know? You're right. You stopped grinding your teeth at night. So I told this to the new dean, somebody who's lived in the Philippines, Dr. Gordon Smith. And he said, oh, that's the kind of dentist I want. So he went down and signed up with Susan Chow and said, I'm the new dean at Regent College. It didn't twig with her until his mouth was full of rubber dent and cotton batten, and she said, oh, you're the new dean at Regent College. And he said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at which point she said, you're the best thing that's happened to Paul's mouth. <laughs> so my grandparents did really hard work. My father has done stressful work, and so have I. And so do you, stressful work. And then from six days to 24-7. Now, I'm only partly connected. I don't have a smartphone. I know that I have a cell phone. It's one of those old flip jobbies, you know? I know it, it's totally, it's crazy. But actually, I did a film the other day, and the filmmaker said, no, 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 this is retro. Keep it. <laughs> it's retro. It's something historic. It's, it's really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but today we're connected 24-7, which is really something. In Japan, employees occasionally work themselves to death. It's called karoshi. I don't want that to happen to anybody in my department. The trick is to take a break as soon as you see a bright light and hear dead relatives beckon. And then from lifetime tenure to scramble, we drove in from the volcano yesterday afternoon and chatting with two lovely young people uh, from here, uh, one of which is working in Qatar as a nurse and the other is actually working on a small island uh, country off of Australia in a detention center.
but we were talking about tenure. And they said things like, you know, that's the thing we don't have. We have no job security. We have no certainty that we're actually going to have a job next year. You know, it used to be in some parts of the world, and I think it was largely true here, that you could count on doing what you're doing mostly for the rest of your life, okay? And in Japan particularly, that was the case. If you got a job with Toyota, it was a lifetime job. That's not true anymore, and it's not true here, and it's definitely not true in Canada. I've had six careers in my lifetime. I'm 78. I'm an old man. I'll be 79 in September, and if I were in China, I'd be 80, because they go by conception, of course. So I don't know whether I'll have yet one more career, but that's the world we're in, and it's very significant that we don't have tenure, but it's a scramble. Have a good vacation. I've decided not, not to give you your bad news until you get back. Oh, I was in an organization where somebody actually experienced this. They came back from their vacation. The HR person invited them into the office and said, I'm sorry to have to tell you, your position is terminated. They just came back from vacation. Oh, boy. I don't know. Would you rather know it before you went on vacation or find out when you get back? Well, those are the little symbols of what's happening in the work world. And it's not universal, but it is happening. But work was meant to be part of our dignity as God-imaging creatures. This is part of our dignity as God-imaging creatures. Now, I'm going to leave if uh, Zanette can give me a a memory stick, and I have one in my pocket later on, I will leave you all these PowerPoints uh, with her, and if you are, are interested in having them, it may be a way of your not trying to take notes because I cover too much too quickly. Okay? So uh, we'll do that, Zinette. Is that okay? I'll try to do that for you. Work was meant to be part of our dignity as God-imaging creatures, In the book of Genesis, you know, I really do love this book. It just tells me what life is all about and who God is and and what his purpose for us is in this world. But in Genesis chapter 1, it says two things about what it means to be made in the image of God. Philosophers have debated and discussed this for centuries. They say, oh, human beings are unique in that they make tools. My wife loves monkeys. And we have watched monkeys making tools and using tools. So it's not that which makes us unique as human beings. I think there's two things in the text of Genesis that helps us understand what it means to be made in the image of God. And first is, we are relational beings. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, He created them. It doesn't mean you have to be married, but it does mean that we're built for community. We're built for community. We're like God in that. God is a community of Father, Son, and Spirit, a communion of love. Each is for the other, and all are for the one. God is more one because he's three, and so he made a creature like himself that was built for community. That's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. One of the most stupid things theologians have ever said is that God made human beings because he was lonely. It's the exact opposite. He has so much love in his being that he had to bear fruit and make a creature like himself. My mom uh, had what we call today a personality disorder. And uh, my father was president of a fairly large company and uh, a man who made decisions and took responsibility. But around the home, he always deferred to my mother and I never understood why until I was 12. 
When I was 12, my dad took me and my older brother aside and told us the family story. My brother is six years older than me. And he said, when you, my brother, were born, mom went into a deep depression. Today we know it's called postpartum psychosis. She was very seriously ill and in the hospital for a long time. And the doctor said, no more children. Don't have any more children. But two years later, mom conceived another baby, and the baby was born dead, a little girl. And mom went into a profound depression again. And the doctor said, no more children. Don't have any more children. And then Tan turned to me, and he said, then you came along. And he could have said, you were a frightening possibility. Or he could have said, you were not planned, that arrogant thing we say today. Or he could have said, you were a mistake. But he said something beautiful, which I treasure to this day. He said, you were a love baby. Now, I do know that, maybe you don't know that term love baby is sometimes used in another way. But he meant it in the right way that I was a love baby, and so are you. No matter what the circumstances of the mother and father that brought you to being, you are born in the love of God, in the love of God, which is incredible, your love babies. So we are like God in the fact that we're relational beings. We're like God, secondly, in that we work and rest. So when we open up the Bible, what's the first thing we find? In the beginning, God up in heaven enjoyed good wine and wonderful Philippine feast. No, it doesn't say that at all. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The very first thing we know about God in the Bible is that he's a worker. In the ancient world, the pictures they had of gods was being up in heaven, drinking wine and ambrosia and having leisure and all kinds of pleasure. And work was something they didn't do. But God works. And he made human beings like himself to work and rest. So he gave us the command to fill the earth. And that doesn't just mean to populate the earth, but to fill the earth with the glory of God. And we can't do that unless we all get out there into the world and make a difference, which is what we're supposed to do. And to rule and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And in chapter 2, verse 15, to work the earth and take care of it. Take care of it. Stewardship. So we're like God in these two things, and work is part of our, our dignity as human beings made in the image of God. It is not a curse. It has experienced some of the curse, yes, because of sin, chapter 3, and so on, sweat of the brow and all the rest. But it was given even before there was sin in the world, it's part of what it means to be a human being. I believe that in heaven, I am going to be a fully human being. That's with a body, a body with hair. I've lost it, but it's going to come back, not just because of some great scalp treatment. Um, and we're going to work, because it's part of our humanity. It's part of what it means. Now, secondly... Human beings are community builders, and work is a practical way of loving our neighbor, improving and embellishing human life. So work is a practical way of loving our neighbor. When I open up the book of Genesis, I find there's three full-time jobs, not just one. The first is communion with God. Adam and Eve were placed in a garden that is a sanctuary garden where God was present not just Sunday morning from 11 to 12, uh, not just quiet time from 7 to 7.15 in the morning, but 
continuously and everywhere communion with God. Full-time job. Secondly, community building. I'm a full-time husband, a full-time father, a full-time grandfather, and we're going to have a great-grandchild this month. So I'll be a full-time great-grandfather. Oh, my goodness, I'm getting old. And I'm also a full-time brother and a full-time neighbor. These, this is part of what it means. It's a full-time job. Even though I can't spend all my time actually directly doing it, but it is. And thirdly, full-time job, making the world work and developing the potential of creation. Community building. I told you that my grandfather on my father's side came from England in 1902 and he had nine children and twenty dollars. Twenty dollars is uh, uh, what a, th- a thousand uh, is that right? Yes, a thousand pesos. That's all he had. And uh, he got a job in a bakery and then eventually he uh, started his own bakery Stephen's Bread and Cakes as you can see. And it, the, the, the van looks pretty spiffy it's got, you know, a beveled glass window. It's really, but the horse looks awful. It's really a sick horse. Anyway, that was my dad. My uh, wife's father, his name is Bolter. That's the family name, uh, Stan Bolter. He's sitting here on an ancient olive oil press where you roll this thing around the olive oil press and squeeze out the oil from the olives, okay? His whole life has been in, in uh, vegetable oil processing from soya, capro, uh, from um, uh, uh, groundnuts, peanuts, and so on. And uh, he retired from being the president of a processing company, moved to Vancouver, but he became the president of the Rape Seed Association of Canada. Anybody know what rape is? I don't mean the bad thing, but I mean the the kernel, rape. It's a yellow flower, and the fields are all yellow. I don't think it's grown in the Philippines. It's grown in more temperate climates. And he knew that rape was an incredible oil. During the Second World War, and you folks went through this in the Philippines, the PT boats had with very fast boats, but they had engines that worked at such high RPMs and were so hot that petroleum oil broke down. And so uh, they had to use rape oil. Rape oil did not break down. So he was in an essential industry in the Second World War because he was producing oil for lubricating these PT boat engines. But he knew that rape oil was really, really good, except it had two acids, which two countries of the world claimed were carcinogenic, cancer-causing. No proof. And so he formed a plant, a, a factory in Canada, to genetically modify rape, to remove these two acids by breeding it with an Argentinian strand. And it was my mother-in-law who said, Stan, you can't call it rape. It's such a bad name in English. Call it Canadian oil. Canola. Canola. So he actually invented canola oil. And almost everywhere I go in the world today, uh, canola oil is what's being used. It's a very, very good oil practical way of loving your neighbor. I wonder if you could identify the gentleman um, third from the right. He's kind of, uh, no, second from the right, excuse me. Um, It says underneath Carol, that man, kind of slouched like this. Could you have any idea who that might be? I assume that some of you have a Roman Catholic background or maybe are currently Roman Catholic This is the late Pope John Paul II as a young man working on a construction site. I, you know, I've appreciated so much the writings of John Paul II, and I, especially on work. And I think, how does this guy understand work so deeply? 
because he's, he's worked. Even as a young man, he worked on a construction site. Uh, we've been to Africa for 10 years, and here's a butchery. <laughs> Great logo, suffering without butter, bitterness. In other words, we do kill the animals and they suffer, but there's no bitterness in the meat. <laughs> These are my friends in uh, Slovakia. They're both uh, sculptors. They don't believe in doing little sculptors. They do big sculptures. But for them, it's, again, a practical way of loving their neighbors, creating something beautiful. And uh, in Thailand, a uh, fisherman, again, it's in our family to be fishermen. And so, uh, again, a practical way, not just to providing for your family. Uh, my wife is on the left here, and she's working with a friend of ours in Africa at the time, uh, mending clothing, uh, and some of you have done that. Clothing, uh, Adam and Eve, was, the Jewish people say, the first blessing in history, first act of loving kindness. Every act of making, providing, and selling clothing is an imitation of God, because God clothed Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? Here's a man who's painting, painting a, a building, a house. So work is a social activity. It's relational. Uh, we're called to work together. One of the things I love about the Philippines and the Philippine work ethic, and you, you've seen it so often, a picture of about 15 Filipino men, usually, not always, carrying a house, but to do it together. And that's one of the unique and wonderful things about the Filipino work ethic is we're working together. But that's what God meant us to do. Uh, work and its organization also impacts social structures. And we become who we are in relationship. And I think of the people I've worked with in my lifetime and how that has impacted me so much. Human relationships and society become more fully realized through work. So when we're in Africa, here you've got some of my students actually building a water cistern. Oh, water is so, so important everywhere in the world. And I think future wars are going to be fought over water. A potable water, drinkable water. But here they were uh, making out of stones, uh, masonry, uh, a water cistern, working together to do it. So one of the early marketplace theologians, his name is Kenneth Concert, said, by creation, human beings are social beings never intended to live alone. Because of our social nature, we're specialized. I wish we had time for every person to introduce themselves and say what they contribute. Because every one of you contributes something. But you have something, you see, I need. And I have something you need. And he goes on to say, we're therefore necessarily dependent on exchange. It's built into our very nature. And that's business. Business is exchange. I have something you want, and you have something I want. And so we exchange. So here is a friend of mine who runs a virtual business. His employees are in three different continents, and nobody lives where he himself works. And so he has this incredible investment company. It's a virtual company. It's a community. And yes, I think we're experiencing a lot of community today virtually. But secondly, and... Uh, I've been emphasizing how work is a means of building community. But thirdly, it's a means of developing the potential of creation. I love the wilderness. I was on the volcano this week for four days, and it's beautiful, wonderful. I love uh, the Canadian wilderness. I try to take canoe trips every summer into the wilderness of Canada. But I don't think God meant everything to be kept as a wilderness. He, he meant us to develop the potential of creation. This is the co-creativity, the third full-time job of human beings. And we do this by making tools. Uh, I'm going to ask you, just I won't look at any faces, so don't be embarrassed, but I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if any of these are things that you do. Does anybody here make tools? 
Nobody does, okay? Beauty. Anybody here? No, no hair salon people? No, nobody makes beauty. No fashion designers? Nobody else? Any, uh, any people who are in uh, commercial design? Nobody? Okay. Music. Anybody here make music? Okay, we got one person. Good. The last living human musician. Uh, comfort. Anybody here makes comfort? Nobody. Okay. Communication. Anybody here involved in communication? You too. But come on, somebody else. Nobody? You All silent. Nobody says anything. Nobody communicates. Nobody facilitates anything on the internet. No, absolutely not. Transportation. Anybody involved in transportation? Nobody. Anybody here who works? Uh, anybody who makes toys or sells toys? or No? Okay. What about accounts? Anybody here who keeps accounts and does good? One person. Way to go. Great. Here's a cartoon for you. These are cave people. <laughs> You can see on the wall he's going one, two, three, four, and a slash. We're neither hunters nor gatherers. We are accountants. <laughs> One of the things I've learned, because I've had friends that are accountants, is that when the economy is going up, you really need accountants. When the economy is going down, you really need accountants. If you want job security, be an accountant. <laughs> no matter what happens with the economy, you're needed. You may not get paid as much when it's going down. How about image? Anybody here makes images? No. Food. Nobody here makes food, right? Anybody here make food? One, two, three. No. None of you ladies make food? How will you ever get married if you don't make food? I mean, you know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Don't you know that? It's the most essential skill in life. <laughs> How about health? Anybody here, in, way back here, two of you, great, health makers. What about garden makers, people that are involved in cultivation? Good one. Anybody else? Uh, research. Anybody research? Two, three people, four, five, six, yes, thank you, seven, eight, nine, good. And what about uh, meaning makers? Oh, boy. One, two, three. Very interesting. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I don't know very much Chinese, but I do know one word, but I never know if I'm speaking Cantonese or Mandarin. It's Sung Yi. And uh, Chinese language is pictorial when it's written. And this is made up of two images, one which is to create, and the other is meaning. And it's the word for business. So business is a way of creating meaning. Very interesting that uh, that's the etymology of the word business. Okay? Work is meant to be an arena of spiritual growth. Oh, this is almost a controversial sentence. Most people say, man, only get spiritual growth by going to the Bible study and by uh, going to the church service and taking a course at ATS and so on, but not by going to work, but it is a means of spiritual growth. Eugene Peterson is famously the translator of the message, which is the Bible in contemporary English. But he has made this, I think, amazing statement. I'm prepared, he said, to contend that the primary location for spiritual formation is the workplace. Wow. Wow. That is, if you want to grow spiritually. Now, let me ask it differently. I don't know anything about your backgrounds, but let's say there's one or two people here who have very, very wealthy parents. So much money that you never will have to work in your lifetime. I've met people like that. We have got quite a few people like that in Vancouver. While I was coming up Edsa this morning, I passed by that section, Bentley Manila, Lamborghini Manila. We've got young people in Vancouver that drive Lamborghinis. 
One of them has an allowance of 100,000 Canadian dollars every month. Just an allowance. $100,000. He never has to work. Would that be good for you spiritually? It would be terrible to win the lottery and never have to work again. Because work does something for us by way of growing spiritually. And we're going to talk about that a little later this morning. And fifthly, work is an investment in heaven. I have to tell you, I've never heard anybody teach this. I've never heard anybody say it. I've never had anybody in my lifetime tell me what I think is really true, which is stuff that I'm doing in this life is actually going to contribute to the new heaven and the new earth. I really believe that. We're actually creating some of the furniture of the new heaven and the new earth. It's beyond our imagination, yes. I don't know. I've written quite a few books, and uh, I don't know whether they're going to be in heaven. I think they could go up and smoke at the end. But I do know that I built a cedar deck for a house, a place where you could sit outside. And it was made with faith, hope, and love. And that's going to be there. It's going to be in heaven, I can tell you. And we're going to have a reunion of this day. And I'll tell you how to get there, because uh, there won't be any GPS, but I'm giving you the instructions, okay? Go down the Gold Street, turn left on Platinum, turn right on Silver, and the second mansion on the left will say Stevens Gallery and Deck. And we're going to have a Starbucks coffee on my deck in the new heaven and the new earth. I'm kind of teasing, but I'm not really teasing. I'm thinking that your work done with, you know, I grew up in this poem, only one life, it will soon be passed, only what's done for Jesus will last. And people said, oh, that means that the only work that lasts is witnessing. Uh, Gospel work, being a pastor, being a missionary, that's the only work that's going to last. You know what? A lot of gospel work won't last. A lot of missionary work won't last because it wasn't done for Jesus. That poem is absolutely right. Whatever is done for Jesus will last. And so you can make a meal for Jesus and you can build a house for Jesus and you can design a program for the computer for Jesus. And in some way beyond our imagination, it's going to last. So, to give you the whole Bible in one screen, this way you don't have to go to seminary, you don't have to read the Bible, you don't have to do anything. It's all here, okay? Three full-time jobs in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. But in Genesis 3, we experience sin. Adam and Eve sinned. This, uh, this desire for autonomy, they wanted to be like God. And it resulted not in communion with God, but alienation. They're hiding from God among the trees of the garden. God's still looking for them, but they're hiding. And instead of community, this loving community of Adam and Eve, there's brokenness in relationships. And instead of the man and the woman being side by side and equal, they now become over and under rule. Your husband will rule over you, yet your desire will be for your husband This is Genesis 3.16, and people think that means even though your husband is going to dominate you, you will still desire him. No, it doesn't mean that. It's the same Hebrew word as Genesis 4.7, when sin uh, was about to overpower Cain, who wanted to murder his brother, and God said, sin is at couching at your door and wants its desire is to overpower you. It's a desire to overmaster the man. And uh, like the woman who said, my husband's the head, I'm the neck, and I can turn the head any way I like. Okay? That's covert rebellion. Okay? 
And everywhere I go in the world, I ask church leaders, is that what God wants? No, it isn't what God wants. It's what human beings, through their sin, brought into the world. What he wants is a side-by-side companionship of men and women. And instead of co-creativity, we've got destructiveness, terrible destructiveness, and work that is punishingly sweaty, hard, and unfulfilling. And those are real problems in the world. But under the new covenant in Christ, in the newer testament, we have access to God once again. We can call God Father. Oh, that is so beautiful. I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, when 50,000, we used to call them hippies, came into Boulder, Colorado. It was the same year we had 50,000 hippies in Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver is very temperate climate in Canada. The rest of Canada is all igloos and polar bears, but Vancouver has a very nice climate. Okay, it's warmer. I'm teasing, of course. That's what I'm, a lot of Americans think that on the 49th parallel, from that on, it's snow and polar bears and igloos. But uh, Vancouver is quite warm, and so a lot of people have come out there, 50,000. And I was teaching in Boulder, Colorado, and a friend of mine uh, rented a fraternity house, and he actually uh, uh, was feeding 125 people every night. And he had a Bible teaching after the supper, which you didn't have to attend, but if you wanted to, you could. And most people stayed. And I was teaching. And about the third row down, there was a young man from Detroit. He, uh, he didn't know who his mother and his father were. We say he grew up on the street. He did not know who his mother and father were. And uh, he was a violent man. We're pretty sure he'd killed some people. But he'd be begun to follow Jesus. And uh, he still had a lot of violence. And, and during my teaching, he was fist fighting with the man on the left and the man on the right. Now, I want you to know, if you fall asleep, that's okay. But if you want to have a fight, I will keep teaching. I don't stop for anything, okay? So anyway, I just kept going. But it became very disruptive. And so the brothers took him outside and counseled him. Counseling for this kind of person means you flatten them out on the concrete, four people sit on top of him, and you talk to him. Okay? So they did this. He's flat on his back on this concrete, and they're talking to him. And then he says, Can I pray? Remember, he did not know who his mother and his father were. And this is how he prayed. God, I've been wanting to call you Daddy for a long, long time. Do you think I could call you Daddy tonight? Oh. The Apostle Paul says, whenever we cry, Abba, Father, a term of intimate respect, Abba. It is his spirit hugging us, bearing witness with us that we are sons and daughters of God. It's beautiful. That's what happens through Jesus. And then we have fellowship together, community building, and we can be neighbors. We can reach out to our neighbor and love. We can have meaningful work and earth keeping. Now, work isn't going to be perfect until we get into the new heaven and new earth, but it can be meaningful, meaningful work and contributed to other people, to our neighbors, through our work. And then when we get to the new heaven and new earth, we're in the book of Revelation. We've gone all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New. You don't have to read the Bible ever again. You've got the whole Bible now. But in the new heaven and new earth, it's continuous communion. Continuous. I mean, if you didn't want to be in God's presence, why would you want to be in heaven? Because that's what heaven's all about. It's being with God all the time. So there's a great English author who said, nobody is ever sent to hell. They insist on going. I think that's true in John chapter 3. This is judgment, that light has come into the world, 
and men loved darkness rather than light. Heaven is going to be continuous communion. And the people, I had such a taste of it this week. We had 34 countries, nurses from 34 countries, mostly women but a lot of men, from 34 countries of the world, very difficult situations. But it was a taste of heaven because while most people will be Filipino in heaven, there's going to be a few Canadians, very few Americans. Uh, but a lot of Filipinos, okay, are going to be in heaven. Uh, and the languages, it's going to be great. You know, it's going to be better than, it'll be a permanent Pentecost in that we're all going to understand each other and I will finally be able to speak in Mandarin. So, uh, which is great. One of the things I'd love to be able to do, the city of God and the people of God. Oh, it's going to be phenomenal and fulfilled creativity. Oh, I'm a frustrated artist, you know. I teach twice as much as professors that are on salary, and I don't really have a lot of spare time for what I've always in my lifetime wanted to do, which is to be an artist. And I do have some artistic flair, but uh, I'm just such a beginner. But remember, down to Gold Street, turn left on platinum, right on silver, it'll say Stevens Gallery and Deck. Stevens Gallery and Deck. Starbucks Coffee. <laughs> okay. Maybe it won't be Starbucks. Maybe it'll be a Jolly Bee. I don't know. <laughs> but fulfilled creativity. You know, the question of the continuity of creation is very important. There are a lot of people, and I'm sorry this came from the United States, that really believe that when Jesus comes again, this whole world is going to go up in smoke. It'll be annihilated. And if that's true, that it's going to be annihilated, and if Jesus is going to make a new heaven and a new earth out of nothing, once again, it doesn't matter what you do with this creation. Just mess it up, because it's all going to go up in smoke anyway. Anyway, it's going to go up in smoke. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches, but it's part of the eschatology Sorry, that's a big word. It means end times, thinking about the end, the consummation. It's part of the eschatology that has come from American evangelicalism. And it's bad because it means it doesn't matter what you do with planet Earth. Whereas, if the second coming of Jesus means not the end of this creation, but the purification of of everything, including your work, including the soil, including the cities, the renewal, the transfiguration, the regeneration of everything. The most wonderful renewal text in the whole Bible is in Revelation 1, 21, verse 5, where Jesus says, Behold, I am making everything new. Oh, Oh, I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. What a vision this is for us of our future that your work, your life, your city, your country is going to be renewed. Will our work last? Does only gospel work have eternal significance? There's a book with the title Earth Crammed with Heaven. It's a lovely title. I've written a few books. I don't know whether you realize it, but the publisher chooses the title, not the author. They know, and they choose the cover. They know it's going to sell. <laughs> they think they do. They sometimes make mistakes. But I'd like to turn it around and say, heaven is crammed with earth. Heaven is crammed with earth. So the kings of the earth in Revelation 21, 24, bring their glories into the holy city. The king of I know there's no king, of the United States is going to bring McDonald's into the holy city. And then I, I'm, I'm not going to say that the king of the Philippines is going to bring Jollibee into the new heaven and new earth, but bringing the best that your culture has, and oh, what rich culture you do have, bringing it into the holy city, Canada and Russia 
and China and Singapore and Malaysia and the South America and Africa. Just think of the rich investment in the new heaven and new earth. And Isaiah tells us that my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands during the reign of the Messiah. We're going to work there. We're not going to be sitting around playing our guitars 24 hours a day. But we're going to work. Yes, we'll probably play our guitars too. And Paul says that our labor in the Lord is not in vain, which is wonderful, wonderful. So Martin Luther on Easter Sunday in 1544, you know he was the great reformer, Protestant reformer. He said, God, this is a compression of a long sermon, okay? There's no way he could have preached so short a sermon. But it's a compression of his sermon. God will create a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness shall dwell. It will be no arid waste, but a beautiful new earth where all the just will dwell together. There will be no carnivorous beasts or venomous creatures, for all such like ourselves will be relieved from the curse of sin and will be to us as friendly as they were to Adam in paradise. Now, every child who has a pet dog that dies asks his mummy or daddy, will my dog be in heaven? And Luther has an answer. There will be little dogs with golden hair shining like precious stones. Now, Luther didn't have the advantage of PowerPoint, but Our Lady of Martyrs Catholic Church had a sign, all dogs go to heaven. But across the road was a Presbyterian church in Quezon City. Only humans go to heaven, read the Bible. Not to be outdone. God loves all his creatures, dogs included. Beulah Press. Dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. Catholic dogs go to heaven. <laughs> Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. Converting to Catholicism does not magically grant your dog a soul. Free dog souls with conversions. Dogs are animals. There aren't any rocks in heaven either. All rocks go to heaven. Oh, wouldn't Luther have loved that? But to continue with his sermon, <laughs> the foliage of the trees, the verdure of the ass, will have the brilliancy of emeralds, and we ourselves, delivered from our mundane subjection to gruel's appetites and necessities, shall have the same form as here, but infinitely more perfect. Our eyes shall be radiant as the purest silver, and we shall be exempt from all sickness and tribulation. Oh, we shall behold the glorious Creator face to face, and then what ineffable satisfaction will it be to find, oh, may this be true, our relations and friends among the just. That's the new big. He says, we commit ourselves without reserve to all the secular work our shared humanity requires of us, knowing that nothing we do in itself is good enough to form part of that city's building knowing that everything from our most secret prayers to our most public acts is part of that sin-stained human nature that must go down into the valley of death and judgment, and yet knowing that as we offer it up to the Father in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit, it is safe with him and purged in fire, it will find its place in the holy city at the end. And N.T. Wright says, In the Lord your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You are following Jesus and shaping our world in the power of the Spirit. And when the final consummation comes, the work you've done, whether in Bible study or biochemistry, 
whether in preaching or in pure mathematics, whether in digging ditches or in composing symphonies, will stand, will last.